At eight years old, I um, grew up in a typical family, mum, dad, three kids, dad was the breadwinner, workplace accident happened, dad passed, didn't have lung insurance in place, had a couple of weeks before his passing, used all the life savings to pay a deposit of home, that was lost for its breach of contract, so pretty much ended up being destitute with a mum who didn't have any real skills to enter the workforce. Mm-hmm. And that was right during the years when apartheid was in place in South Africa. Sanctions were in place, employment wasn't very good. Not a good position to be in. No empowering women. No, de- definitely not, so it was, not back then. No. When you're talking late 70s. Welcome to the Beers with a Minor podcast. My name is Mad Mumsy and I've been driving the huge dump trucks in Australian open cup mines for over 10 years now. I wish I had a dollar for everyone who said to me, how does a little thing like you drive those big trucks? Oh, you must be rich. How do I get a job doing that? My mining friends are asked these questions all the time too. This is what started the Mad Mumsy journey to share stories and tips from living a mining lifestyle and to let others know what it's really like. Tune in each episode as I sit down for a relaxed chat, usually over a few beers with a fellow miner. Women and blokes with various experience, roles and opinions share their lessons and stories with you. Not everyone is cut out to be a miner, but why not? What does it take to thrive and survive in this industry? Now, let's dig in. Get it? Dig? Mining? Oh, I crack me up. Hello and welcome to episode 61 of the Beers with a Miner podcast. In this happy hour episode, I speak with Monica Ponmoon, that's Monica with a K, And Monica is the new financial advisor for our sponsor, Bantax Accounting Group. I had a great afternoon meeting Monica over lunch, and then we went back to the office, the Bantax office here in Mackay, to learn all about why she's been so passionate to help us to do the best we can with our money ever since she was eight years old. That was a real surprise to me. Yeah, you heard it right, eight years old. Growing up in South Africa puts a whole new perspective on it, I suppose, but it doesn't matter where you are, what happened to her dad and then her family really tore at my heartstrings and it helped me to understand where Monica was coming from. Like I say, it really doesn't matter if it was South Africa or South Australia, where I'm from, what happened to her family is a big lesson for all of us. And that's why I really think this episode is going to be so valuable for you. I have a lot of respect for this strong, wonderful lady, and I can see a nice friendship brewing. Can you feel me smiling? (laughs) We cover things like the important... It sounds so boring, but it's so important, right? We cover things like the importance of a will, the difference between your will and your superannuation when it comes to your estate, income protection, funeral insurance, and, well, so much more. This isn't part of my woo-woo brain that I like. This is, I'm right brain and this is left brain, or the opposite, I can never remember. (laughs) Um, But I'm all woo-woo and, you know, I don't want, I, I prefer... A MindMeister mind map. Google it, MindMeister. I'll leave a link in the show notes, which can be found at mabumsy.com forward slash beers61. But I don't do spreadsheets. I do, you know, nice, lovely open drawings. So that's that's where I'm from. And when I have to sit down with the likes of three wonderful financial gurus in our town over lunch and then come back and interview Monica. Uh, My brain was a bit fried, but I'm inspired. I've got lots of homework, and I reckon after this you're going to have a lot of homework too, and the reason is because you need to get your shit sorted with your money. And if you're one of those people, like Monica, maybe, um, you know, good on you. But if you know someone who needs to hear this, please share it. Please share it with your mates, as I always say at the end, but... For this episode, I'm going to say it at the start. 
hopefully you will enjoy our chat. We don't go on for hours and hours because, you know, time is money when you're interviewing a financial guru. <laughs> no, that's not why. That is not why at all. I had other jobs to do for my wonderful Julia at Bantax County Group because I do her online blog posts and stuff. So, uh, yes, it was a great afternoon all round and I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Oh, and of course, let's dig in. Get it? Dig? Mining? <laughs> I crack me up. Hi, crack me up. Hello and welcome to the podcast, Monica. Here we are in Bantax Accounting Group's offices in Mumbai. It's um, so good to have you here. Thanks, Leanne. Lovely to be here. Um, we've been down and had a nice lunch together. And because we're in, you know, corporate offices, I yeah. didn't think I should smuggle a beer in. <laughs> yeah, probably not a good image, but it would have been welcome. It would have too, wouldn't it? But luckily we did have one over our lunch, so yeah. so we're fine. Um, so I'm sitting here with my water. What a good girl. Speaking of beer, yeah. before we dig into the episode, do you get it? Dig? Mining? Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, I get it. Oh, <laughs> crack me. Um... <laughs> The first question I ask, sometimes it's the last question because we just go straight into it and I forget and we say it at the end, but since this podcast is called the Beers with a Minor podcast, I like to ask my guests what's their favourite beverage. It might be beer, wine, spirit, or perhaps even a cup of tea. What is yours, Monica? I enjoy a good beer. I'm kind of partial to Great Northern at the minute, Uh, but having said that, with summer coming up, I do enjoy a good gin and tonic as well. Tonic water seems to help with mosquito bites, which can be a problem here in Mackay, so it's a good excuse to drink. Wow, really? Well, I didn't know that. Uh, I don't think it's scientifically proven, but it seems to work for me, so it's all good. So as it's coming out of your pores, (laughs) (laughs) it must be. (laughs) Do you have it in a short or long glass? Uh, Normally a long glass. With ice? Yeah, with ice, slice of lime, yeah. Hear it tinkling now. Mm-hmm. We might go back to that restaurant around the corner now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's start with your story. Uh, you are a financial planner. Correct. So, what made you want to be a financial planner? Let's start with that. Oh, uh, it, it's kind of, I didn't plan at the outset to become a financial planner. Um, there were things that happened in my, my past that sort of made me realise um, that I didn't want to be financial independence on any one particular person as an adult and as a result landed up working in the financial services industry, um, moved continents. If you haven't picked up already, I've got a bit of a funky accent. So. Oh, I think what you're a Kiwi young. No. <laughs> <laughs> I often get called that. It's all right. It's my yeah. second adopted home. Yeah. Um, no, from South Africa. South so, Africa. yeah, um, come across big ocean come here and kind of fell into financial advice or financial planning um, working in the financial services industry which I've done since I've pretty much left school probably that stemmed from the fact that I wanted to be in control of my financial future wasn't going to have somebody else control that for me or be in a position where I didn't have that control and if something were to happen to my significant other husband where my world would fall apart. Having lived through that once, wasn't going to go through it again. So, so yeah. I'm not sure how much of that you want to share, um, that, that story, mm-hmm. but um, can you share any of that? You did tell me a little bit before, and you, the biggest part that I took from that was that it was since you were eight years old. Yep, yep. at eight years old, I um, grew up in a, a very middle-class family, you know, typical family, mum, dad, three kids. Dad was the breadwinner, mum stayed at home. Home mum, um, workplace accident happened, dad passed, didn't have life insurance in place, um, had a couple of weeks before his passing, used all the life savings to pay a deposit on the home. Um, that was lost because it was breach of contract, so pretty much landed up being destitute um, with a mum who didn't have any real skills to enter the workforce. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was right during 
the years when apartheid was in place in South Africa, sanctions were in place, employment wasn't very good, not a good position to be in. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And that would do it, wouldn't it? Jeez. Yeah. And a, a women, no, no uh, empowering of women. No, de- definitely not, so was, not back then. No. I mean, you're talking late 70s. Mm. Um, so, yeah, still very much a patriarchal society. Women were not so prominent in the workforce, and if they were in the workforce, generally doing sort of, you know, the, what I would call Girl Friday kind of jobs. Mm. Um, the girl jobs. The yeah. things the girls did, the women, yeah. 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 Um, so not highly paid jobs or anything of that kind of thing. So moving from that middle class sort of environment to pretty much just living above the water, you know, bread line, mm. um, hand to mouth, literally, um, was a big adjustment, and yeah, at eight years old, a very hard lesson to learn. But it's made me who I am today, and yeah, it still hurts to talk about it. Mm. But you know what? It's being human, and you've got to learn from your experiences. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. I really appreciate that. So, from there, is that when you then went to New Zealand? No with family, or no, no. We we stayed in South Africa and moved um, across to. Australia 13 years ago now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, grew up in, in South Africa and then come across here. But I've got a lot of Kiwi friends and, yeah, because they always confuse me for a Kiwi, I've just adopted New Zealand as my second home. Oh, so. right. So <laughs> you didn't, you haven't actually no. gone. Oh, okay, sorry. No. Visited there a few times, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't been there yet and I'm from South Australia. Mm-hmm. And so people always ask me where I'm from. You're yeah. from England or New yeah. Zealand. Like, no, I'm from South Australia, that's where all the bombs went to live when they, you know, came across on the boats mm-hmm. and all of that, and there's a lot down there, so, yeah, yeah I understand that. I, I say grant instead of grant. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. The little and, and maroon, not maroon. Yeah. Well, I say maroon. So you, oh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. well, there you go. That's it, we're all, we're all different, and that's what makes the world go around, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly different. right, yeah. Ah, oh, here's a good segue. Speaking of difference... <laughs> So you're a financial planner and Julia, who has been on the podcast before, I'll leave a link to Julia's episode in the show notes, which for this episode can be found at madmumsy.com forward slash beers 61, that's number 61. To listen to Julia, you can read us the guy that does mine as well, me, you know, but <laughs> she's an accountant, right? Yep. And a very savvy businesswoman, she's many hats, but... You're a financial advisor. Yep. So what is the difference between a financial advisor and an accountant? Accountants deal primarily with your tax issues and looking at legal ways to minimise or reduce the amount of tax you pay. Uh, we, on the other hand, as financial advisors, look at your financial goals and how we get you from where you are today to where you want to be and start putting plans in place for you to get there, um, whether that be you know, putting your kids through school purchasing an investment property or paying off your first home before, or your home, let's say, before you retire, or having a comfortable retirement, whatever that comfortable is to you, because um, mm-hmm. it's different things to different people, is what we look at. Um, we also look at ways of how we protect your assets, your lifestyle, and make sure that your kids don't go through what I went through as a kid. So if something happens to you, you know your kids are going to be well looked after and their lifestyle isn't going to be turned on its head. Mm-hmm. So that's where we come in and we look after your wealth side of things. And that's something that um, as parents, we leave a legacy to our children, we don't want that to be here. Yeah. The, um, the, all the things we didn't get done that we should have done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned earlier about the lottery of life. And how we just never know when mm-hmm. <laughs> when your numbers are going to come up. And we were talking about at lunch how I like to have a little go in the lotto each week because yep. it keeps me hopeful that, you know, I'll be good in a minute. Yeah, um, yeah. But the lottery of life is different. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, you don't know when your number's going to be called. And if you, all you need to do is look at the news lately and you see younger people dying. I mean, car accidents happen. People die in car accidents. doesn't matter what age you are. It could be a no-fault accident. It could be, you know, you have a blowout riding down Bruce Highway at 100 k's. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you, you could be, you know, having an accident by yourself for argument's sake and, you know, 
leave something behind. You don't want to be leaving a mess behind. You don't want to be leaving people destitute behind. So it's a case of making sure you, you take control of your future beyond from the other side. Mm. Um, and one way of doing that is making sure you have a law in place. Um, yeah, we don't like to do it because it means we're going to die. It means we're acknowledging we're going to die at some mm. point. And that's probably the biggest hurdle for any human is to acknowledge their mortality. But it's a very important one to acknowledge. It's sad to think about, but it's life, it's reality. And we're going to you know, sometimes put the big girl pants on and, and do, those, yes. do those things that can't get you. Yeah. So can I ask you a question? Because I had a will done when I first left um, my past life, as I call it, when I first yeah. started in mining. And I got it done in an office down in New South Wales. I mm-hmm. paid and went into a place and I got it in my filing cabinet. Yep. Is that enough? Because I've never been back there. That was 15 years ago. If there's been no significant change to what you want to have happen with your assets when you pass, then it's fine. Okay. How but do they find it? Well, ideally you've nominated an executor and you will have told your executor hopefully where they might find it. I don't know. <laughs> well, they know the they know where in my filing cabinet, yep. if something happens, go there. Yep. So I guess that's one thing. Yep. Yep. So, so yeah, that, that's typically where they would go, find it, pick it up, and then start working with it from there. Yeah. So when you die, there's not a spreadsheet of... <laughs> that's ridiculous. But do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, the, 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 the will people aren't going to come and say to my kids, well, here, your mum did will with us 15 years ago. They have to know where it is and find it. Generally, the, yeah, generally the, the onus lies with the, whoever the executor is to, to locate the latest will and then carry out your wishes from there. Okay. So can you talk about some of the, I swear to get ready, the shit, the downfalls, the crap that goes on when someone doesn't have a will because I've heard some horrific stories. And Well, yeah, there, there's a lot that can go wrong. Because um, you may have a blended family, for argument's sake, where you've got ex spouses maybe on one side or both sides. Um, you've got parents that might want to get involved. You might have minor children or adult children. They're all going to want a piece of the pie, so you might end up with them having a huge big bun fight once you've gone to the other side because they all feel entitled to a piece mm. of you know whatever's left behind, um, and in what proportion they get it. That, that's one of the big things. Um, obviously, if there is a dispute or something like that going on, it is going to take a long time for your will to get burned up and your assets to be dispersed how you want them to be. Um, so, yeah, that, that's probably one of the big things. The other thing is when there's minor kids involved, depending on the family situation, if there is no guardian named in the will, those kids could land up in foster care, mm. um, which is probably not an ideal situation, especially no, when they're not dealing with... an ideal with, situation yeah. no. Uh, when they're dealing with grief and so on. But, mm. you know, depending on how many people make application to the court to be guardians of the kids, um, it could be a case of, you know, the, the courts may say, well, in this instance, while we're sorting all of this out, let's put those kids into foster care um, to take them out of a conflict situation type of arrangement. But again, you know, it, it may or may not happen, but who would want it to? Who would even want to think that that could happen to them and their kids? And the sad thing is it does happen, doesn't it? It does, yeah, it does. Um, I couldn't think of anything worse if I still had young kids for them to be put in that sort of kind of situation. Mm. Well, for yourself to be in that situation if your sister dies and who's going to look after the kids, mm-hmm. for one instance, I'm thinking, and then their side of the family wants the kids, but you know they'd be better off with you. Yep. Of course, they'd be better off. <laughs> they're or they're better not, or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can see both sides of the family, mm-hmm. yeah, and even within families, obviously, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah the grandparent might think they'd be better mm-hmm. than the deadbeat dad or the deadbeat mum. Yeah, you never yeah, know. You just never know. No, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And also, I've heard bad things about if you have your will through the public trust, or if there's no will, it goes to the and they sort it out. Is that right? Oh, if there's no will and nobody steps forward to take over the role or a 
applies to the corpse to, ta- to become executor of your estate and can land up in the hands of the public trustee. It can take a very, very long time for them to wind it up because they always have to do their due diligence and checks and balances before they decide who gets what and in what proportions. Um, and they also will charge a fee, normally based as a percentage of the estate. Um, so normally, yeah, you can go to the public trustee, you can have your will drawn up through them, they won't charge you for it. Um, but normally what I'd suggest to, to people who look at, it, at doing their wills through that avenue as a cheap way of getting a will done is say, well, don't nominate the public trustee as your executor, nominate someone else because who knows what that fee can be. I've heard that it can be up to 20% of the value of your estate, no. which is a huge chunk. That's nearly a quarter. Yeah. Isn't that you're the, I'm not the maths girl. Yes, <laughs> yeah. 25% quarter. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's just shy of a quarter. Um, that's what I've heard, but it can be up to that. So whether or not they do take you know that much every time, who knows. Um, but again, if you have an executor, someone you've named who you trust, who's going to look after to carry out your will and your the wishes in the way you want them to, that's probably a better peace of mind for you, really, from that you're going to be on the other side, so who cares? <laughs> well, Mad Mums, I'm with Lou Lou, so I believe I'll be watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll be with you in spirit now. See, I did all the right things because mm-hmm. I listened to episode 61. <laughs> with yeah. Monica. Yeah. Oh, dear. All right, so anything else with the states that you want to talk about, other than wills or...? Uh, just another observation is, and um, I, I speak about it quite often when I meet with clients, is everybody thinks that their estate is the be-all and end-all of their assets. Um, however, when you've got superannuation, which most working South, um, South Africans, Dan, Australians. <laughs> How long do, you been here? <laughs> 13 years, lucky 13, um, which most Australians do have um, because it's compulsory nowadays. Your superannuation does not form part of your will or your willable estate, estate assets um, straight away because mm-hmm. it is a separate legal entity. So you need to make a separate superannuation nomination of beneficiary and make sure that that is in place and up to date. Because your superannuation, they ask you that quite regularly. Yeah. So yearly maybe. It's if more, this is still right. Yeah, you're normally on your annual statement that you get from superannuation, it will show there if you've got a nomination in place and who, who you've nominated. Um, quite often they do require them to be updated every three years, mm-hmm. but there are some superannuations out there who offer what we call non-lapsing nominations, which means once you make it and put it in place, it's going to be there until you change it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's just something... A, a different little aspect that needs to be kept in. So we need to have a will and we also need to make sure that and with an executor mm-hmm. and we also need to make sure that we have named our current beneficiaries, not the ones from 10 years ago that were on their old mate and all their kids or whatever, mm-hmm. make sure that's up to date with your superannuation because it's separate. I yep. didn't know that. I yep. thought it would be part of the estate. Unless you nominate on your superannuation nomination that your benefits get paid to your estate and dealt with as part of your will, it actually is a separate asset and a separate legal entity, so it doesn't fall part of your will automatically. So you can do that? Yep, you can do that. Yeah. yeah. I knew this would be gold. I've got, I've got homework. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of homework. So while we're touching on superannuation, mm-hmm. um, people working in the mines, you can get... It adds up pretty quick. I wasn't yeah. there too long. Well, you know, I mean, I started eight. I started at forty, yeah. and I did not really have any super to speak of. Mm-hmm. Um, but it soon starts to add up when you're earning more income, and it's a percentage of that income yeah. that goes in. So, have you got any anything to say to us about super? Firm believer in making sure that that you look at your super as your retirement nest egg. Treat it as your money because it is your money. Mm-hmm. Um, I quite often get asked the question, well, the government's going to take my super away from me. And the answer is no, they can't really um, because it's, it's your money. Probably very highly unlikely that it will happen, but you just never know. Okay, uh, But for most of the other supers out there, the industry supers or the retail supers, 
enough government can't access it. So it is your money. You should look after it as you would any of your other investments. Mm. So take ownership of it. Look after it. Make it work for you. Is the super that you're using the one that your employer said, well, this is the one we use and you've just gone, yeah, righto, we'll carry on with that one. Don't actually know or understand it. Um, it's important that you do because quite often in superannuation, especially industry funds, you'll find that they're invested in what's a life stage model, which is based on your age generally. Um, may or may not be the right fit for you. May or may not get you the end result that you need. And that's where having a review of your super and talking to a financial advisor or financial planner, whichever term you want to use, is where they can actually drill down and have a look if it is the right fit for you Mm. and and make recommendations around whether or not that needs to be adjusted. Because there's more to it than just your age. Like, oh, you're nearly 50, so therefore you've had your kids, there's this, that, but everyone would be different in your stage of life, within your life, if it that makes sense. Is that what you yeah. mean? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what I'm yeah. saying. I mean, you may have somebody, when, when they draw up or, or put together their life stage models, um, they'll say, okay, we expect every 50-year-old to have kids that have left home. Um, they've probably still got a little bit of a mortgage, but you know, they're quite affluent in terms of they've got money in the bank or investments or whatever. So we don't need to take as much risk with their super because theoretically they should have a balance of 150 or 200,000. The reality is you might be 50 years old with only 50,000 in super. Well, you need that 50,000 to work extra hard for you because you don't have all the other bits and pieces that have been assumed for you. Mm, like a house. Or, yeah. 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 So you might need to take a little bit more risk with your super to get that better growth to get where you need to be when you retire. Mm. Or it could be a case of, well, maybe I don't want to take that extra risk, but what other ways can I grow my super? One of the ways you can grow super is looking at making extra contributions. And that's where quite often it becomes working with accountants, where we look at what's going to be the best tax outcome for you when you're on one of the big mining salaries. How do we best get that money into super for you in a way where we can reduce your tax liability? Mm. So, so you're going to pay a lot of tax to yeah. Well, so oh, if you're not doing it right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, and and this is when it becomes really important for financial advisors and accountants to work closely together for a common goal with the client. So at the end of the day, we want to get you in the best financial position, not only from a wealth point of view, but we need to look at the tax side as well because you can't focus on one without the other. Mm. So, say for instance, if someone listened to this episode, oh, Monica Whitaker is my go-to girl <laughs> for financial advice um, or financial planning for the future, but I really like my current accountant. Mm-hmm. Do you work with other accountants, or do they have to come and see Julia and because you're a team? Or no, they can still keep the accountants of preferred choice. Obviously, if they don't have an accountant, they will to ban tax accounting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they can still work with their preferred accountant and I'm more than happy to work with accountants. So work, I have worked and will continue to work with other accountancy firms mm-hmm. for common clients. That's good. Yeah, because I've always wondered about that. Now for a word from our sponsor, Julia Hartman and the Bantax Accounting Group. Julia's my awesome accountant. She's written two books with financial expert Noel Whitaker, and she's got a passion to help us miners make the most out of our hard-earned cash. She's got heaps of tips and make sure that we get every cent we are meant to get and is right on the ball with everything. If you head to bantax.com.au forward slash miners, that's B-A-N-T-A-C-S, you can download a free booklet all just for us miners. And there's also a spreadsheet in there that helps you check off what tools you have for your trade, like your isolation lock, work boots, seven shirts, all of these sorts of things. And you can weigh them up and it'll tell you if you qualify weight-wise to claim your trips out to work. And that's just one of the things that they've got over there. So I strongly urge you to head to bantax.com.au forward slash miners and see what they can do and find your 
nearest office as we come up to tax time. They're really on the ball, know what's going on with the tax department and there's heaps of other free information like property investing. If you really plan on doing some great things with your money, you want to do that, right? If you want to sell your house, you can save a lot of money if you find out what to do first rather than in hindsight. And Julia, she'll, you know, make sure you get it right. And if you do it wrong and then go and see her, she'll <laughs> she'll up you <laughs> in the nicest possible way because she really cares about us and wants us to keep our money and not give it to the tax department. Anyway, head over to bantax.com.au forward slash miners and tell them Mad Mumsy sent you. I remember I went in uh, to the bank mm-hmm. and to talk about the mortgages and get things all, you know, doing the right thing. Yeah. And they took me next door to see the financial advisor mm-hmm. and wanted me to spend, it was nearly $700 a week mm-hmm. on income protection, this, all these things. I'm like, $700 a week, you know. So I didn't, I didn't go ahead and do it. it sounded exorbitant and even when I came back in and told the lady from the bank that I'd been speaking with yeah. what they just gave me, she was quite horrified herself mm-hmm. because I, I don't know if this is true and you know, they've just had the Banking Royal Commission because of these sorts of things, I guess, but to me it was in the boom, in the cry, mm-hmm. slowly coming back up, but um, just saw I had Two houses, working in the mines, you can afford, you need to have this, you need to have that. Mm-hmm. And I didn't feel like I did, so I didn't do it because yeah. it was a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and, and Mark is so, 700 bucks a week is a lot of money. Uh, I mean, if you were to tell me I'm going to pay that insurance premiums, so I'd have exactly the same attitude. Yeah. Um, and that's something, again, conversation that needs to be had between financial advisor and client is, yeah, in the ideal world, this is all the cover you should have. Yes, it's going to cost you $700 a week, but is that what you can actually afford? Is that what you're comfortable with? Because mm. um, while insurance is important, I'll have the view that it's only good if it's not taking food off your table. Mm. So you've got to strike that balance. I mean, we don't hesitate about insuring cars, insuring you know, physical material belongings, but if something happens to us, ourselves personally, what do we have if we're not earning an income? Mm. So a lot of people rely on their super for insurance. I have, I know Julia has told me off for that because there's so many things that aren't covered. Correct, yes. And Correct. during the conversation over lunch, I heard an interesting chat about an, if you are covered like you get this extra bonus if it's <laughs> bonus if you're dead, right? Um, <laughs> but if you have an accidental death, you're, you're like, I think with mine, I might be covered for so much, but if it's accidentally, I get more, or they get more, so I'm not here. Um, but then you ladies started talking about what constitutes an accident and what a grey area that can be, and I'd never heard that one before. Correct. Um, yeah, accident policies are out there. And, yeah, they do cover cover you if you do die in an accident. However, there's normally quite strict criteria around what constitutes an accident. Um, some of them, as you heard over lunch, it is you've got to die at the scene pretty much. <laughs> so if you don't die at the scene, well, no, you didn't die as a result of the accident, even so if you died two or three days later. Or they took you in the ambulance to go to hospital, yeah. die at hospital. Yeah. Burr, burr. Yeah, exactly right. Fine print. It's a fine print. Um, And there are a lot of them and there's a lot of variations. So there's no sort of one sort of brush that covers them all. Mm. Um, You've got to look at each one of those policies individually to see if they're actually worth the paper they're written on the premium that you're paying at the end of the day. And that's where bringing those sort of things to come and see you or a financial advisor. Correct. We're not saying you have to come here, but I'm saying come here. (laughs) Um, that's why it's important to go and have that discussion. Exactly right. And um, there's a lot of grey area in terms of the insurances, the default insurances inside super as well. Um, 
when you've got your default cover inside super, you're not the policy owner. The trustees of that superannuation fund are the policy owner. So they are in control of your policy. So if they need to have terms and conditions changed because it's going to get them a cheaper premium rate for 1,000 or 2,000 members of an industry fund, they can do it. You don't really know about it. Yeah, you might get a little email or a piece of paper in the mail that says, hey, we've made a change to insurance. If you want to find out more, go to this website and click on the link. Mm -hmm. um, and how often do we do it? Mm -hmm. Oh, we're meant to, though, aren't we? I've you been you're meant we to. should. you mean meant to. And legally, the super fund and the trustees have met their legal obligation because they've informed you that there's a, a change. Mm -hmm. The fact that you haven't gone and actually had a look at it, well, yeah. that they can't hold your hand and force you to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, again, yeah, your insurance is inside superannuation. Sometimes they're necessary and sometimes you have no choice but to have them for whatever reason. It could be affordability, it could be health reasons, it could be the occupation you're in. So it could be any number of factors. Um, and, you know, some insurance is better than no insurance. But if you can afford to have tailored insurance where you're in control of the policy, terms and conditions agreed to before your first premium is paid, well, that's the first price, isn't it? Mm. I found when I stopped working for a while and I still had my super and I thought, well, if anything happens, I'm covered, I've got, like you say, I've got that, at least there's something there, some yep. kind of insurance that I might fall into or I might not. Um, but then once I wasn't contributing into it anymore, they sent me a letter and said, you're not contributing, this insurance will be cancelled, I'm pretty sure. But yep. then I went back to work, so it didn't end up becoming an issue. But I thought, oh, I've, because it, I thought they just used the money they had to pay into it or some other myself. <laughs> no, obviously I wasn't right. No, and again, that, that comes back to whatever terms and conditions and rules the trustees of your super have in place, mm. um, typically with your big industry funds. Um, in recent months, from the 1st of July this year, so probably in about May, June, um, members of superannuation funds where contributions haven't been received for 13 months would have received notification to say, if you don't receive a contribution or if you don't send a little letter back to us telling us you want to keep your insurance in super, we're cancelling it from the 1st of July. Mm -hmm. um, it was legislation that was brought in. I received one of those letters for one of my super funds that I've got. Yes, I know I'm a financial advisor. I've got more than one super. Because that was one of my questions. Are we meant to do the how do you <laughs> find my super dot com or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's gold. Yeah. It shows that you're a real person. Yeah, it does. Is that on your list of homework that you just haven't gone around to? It was actually done for a specific reason, ah. um, which is why I do have more than one super fund, uh -huh. um, but that reason no longer exists, so it is on the list to do to actually okay. consolidate that and get it to one place now. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, even financial advisors sometimes have more than one super. So, yeah, from 1st of July, new legislation passed that if, contributions weren't received, insurances were to be cancelled. I got one of those letters, sent it back to my super, made sure that I've got my insurance still in place because I do have some insurance through my super. Again, specifically done for specific reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I can bet your bottom dollar there's a heap of people who would have looked at that letter and gone, what the? File 13, in the bin, who cares? I'll get to it tomorrow. Yeah. And they're potentially sitting with little no insurance right mm. so again something we need to understand and have a look at on a regular basis is how does our super and our insurance work and how do we use that to make sure that we are getting where we need to be for our financial future and the future of our beneficiaries if we happen to pass so it's about knowing where we're at mm -hmm. and staying on top of it not just carrying on correct Carry on. I don't know if that's the right word. You know what I'm trying to say is it's just, yeah, yeah, I've got super, I've got this, I've got that, yeah. but to go in, like they say, ring up your telephone people and see if you can get a better mm -hmm. deal. Every time I ring up to get a new phone or something, I end up with paying less yeah. because clearly I've been paying more. 
Yeah, you know, you should. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're saying loyalty costs mm. because they know you're going to stick with them, so you can get charged for it. They get charged for being loyal. How's that right. figure? Right. Yeah, they never renew. you. Oh, hi, this is Telstra here. We're just letting you know we could save you fifty dollars and give you a new iPhone six. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sure. It's what happened to me exactly. Yeah. And then I realised my phone that I have is later than an iPhone six anyway. Mm. Dodgy advisors. Are they, you know, financial so-called gurus in the past? Um, I know there was a big mob up in Townsville. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing their offices and heaps of people lost a lot of money. And so it's hard to build build back trust. Did you find that affected um, your industry? Or? Yes, it has, mm-hmm. and there definitely has been um, a fair bit of fallout with the Royal Commission as well um, around you know, investigations into financial services and banking. Um, so, yeah, financial advisors have had a bit of a hot cup for the last while in terms of retaining and building credibility. With the changes that have happened, a lot of those dodgy advisors will have been flushed out of the system. There are new education requirements that are coming in, um, which is, again, going to make it moving financial advice just from being a job or an industry into more of a professional environment. So we'll be required to uphold similar standards as what accountants and solicitors do, uh, which I think is a very positive move Mm -hmm. um, for the industry because at the end of the day, the person you're sitting across the table with and talking about your financial affairs is someone you've got to have complete trust in because if you can't trust them to help you get to your financial goal, well... There's a problem. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And you want them to be across all the latest mm. updates and law changes and yeah. um, legislation. I think that's the word, isn't it? Yeah. Legislation. Legislation laws. Yes, yeah, same thing. It sounds like a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is why I love Julia mm-hmm. um, and Bad Tax, mm-hmm. our sponsor for the episode. Um, well, for the whole podcast, not just the episode all the time. Yeah. But it's because she's so passionate about it and believes in it and just wants to help us all not give out bloody money to the tax man. Mm-hmm. Um, we've earned to keep it and there's ways to do it. And find an accountant, I recommend you guys, bantax.com.au, to find your nearest store. Oh, yeah. This is cool. This isn't why we got you on, though, as a yeah. big fat juicy plug. It's yes. um, because... I wanted to help my people, my you, you who are listening right now, um, mm-hmm. those of you who are trying to get into mining, well, set yourself up now when you get that money. Mm-hmm. You know, go in and all, oh, I'm a rich miner now, and then before you know it, you end up like me. You didn't do the right things and get in trouble from Julia. <laughs> yeah. Do find out first, get set up for success, and for the ones, the listeners who are already working in the industry mm-hmm. and on the right, on the good money, are you doing it right? What can you tweak? Yeah. 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 You have yeah. that conversation with your family. That's something else that came up at, mm-hmm. at lunch as well was about um, we've spoken about kids, looking after your kids, but you've got partners, we've got parents that we're looking yeah. after and we've got something to to speak about. Them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously if you've got elderly parents that you're going to be looking after either now or in the future, you want to make provision for them. So, again, it's a case of looking at, well, how do you do that best? Um, because you don't want to reach a point where you're thinking, okay, right, I can you know, come out from the mines, I can take a town job and you know, stop easing back from, from, from working so hard um, because I've built up a good nest egg for myself and you don't want that sort of rug ripped out from underneath you because something happens, mum and dad needs to go into aged care and, you know, contributions to go into aged care are quite costly or they need a full-time carer and you can't afford to give up your job so you've got to pay for someone to look after them and it's going to create quite a financial strain on you. So again, it's looking at, well, and this is part of what financial advice is about, is looking at that family unit and saying, well, this is what it looks like now, but what's going to happen in the future? How do we need to safeguard against that and what can we do now to start creating a safety net for the what-ifs? And it could be as simple as using a regular savings plan into a bank account or an invested 
you know, investment manager fund or, I don't know, direct shares, whatever it is, whatever suits the amount of risk or, or what it is that we need to do for you. Um, so it's looking at that kind of thing. Or it could be as simple as saying, well, okay, I've got a you know, 20-year-old son. He's got two kids. And, geez, he's 20 and got two kids and a bit concerned. But, <laughs> and, you know, um, but it could be a case of, well, something happens to him and you suddenly got to look after kids that you weren't banking on looking after. Mm. And you've got to grow up kids again. So how do you safeguard against that? Well, That's really common, actually. Yeah. Grandparents. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's looking at that. I mean, you don't want to have to delay your retirement for twenty years while you're growing up somebody else's kids, even if they are your grandkids. Mm. Um, yeah. So what can you do to try and safeguard against that? It's all about the, the looking at the what ifs and trying to put you in the best financial position to make sure that those are covered to the best possible ability based on affordability. Mm. What about? Um, just having a flashback to a conversation I had with a lady about my private health and <laughs> no comments. <laughs> we don't talk about that. But we don't even have to talk about private health, but this is the sort of reason, use this as a reason to talk to whether it's your super or your, um, like we were saying, Telstra, for example. With my financial... Uh, Private health, that's it. Like, I'm doing this with my fingers. You can't see. I'm going, oh, I'm trying to make my brain think. Um, I rang them up. I, I did the uh, compare the pair, compare oh, yeah. the market or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And the people that I was with came out as the best for my situation and it was $70 a month cheaper than I was paying. Yeah, again, loyalty. You pay for loyalty. I know. <laughs> So I rang them up and they said, well, let's have a look at this. And because, you know, look at me, I'm already trying to, I'll have the top, I want the top of everything. Just give me the most expensive one because I know I'm covered for everything in my yep. brain. But I was covered for IVF. Yeah, right. And they said, so you, the lady's going, so we'll just run down. Are you planning on having any more children? <laughs> I laughed. I said, don't be ridiculous. No. And because I was 50 at the time, I think, about 50. I said, no, that's not happening. She said, well, you know you're paying for IVF. I said, really? Yeah, actually, just under 50, I think. And then she said, um, and how are, your, how are your hips? Are you planning on hip replacement anytime soon? I'm like, well, no, <laughs> pretty good. She said, well, you're, I was at both ends of the scale, so I was paying for what I would want as a young mother and what I would want as an old mother who's who's gonna have a hip replacement probably, you know, everything starts as mum says, everything starts by you going wrong, you know, yeah. the older you get. And but I had still another thirty years before that point. She said, What we can do is give you this and had some lovely name for it, but it was for it made it sound for old people. Yeah. But she said, Forget about what it's called <laughs> Okay. This is what I recommend because this is the life situation we're in probably 10 years earlier than, like I guess, like what you were saying, super, they assume, at that yeah. age is going to be for that. So for medical benefits, it's, you know, I was 40s, I still could have gone either way. And yeah. I said, I said I wanted the most expensive, so that's what they gave me. Yeah, yeah. So and that it, saved me all that money. Again, something simple like that, just reviewing your health insurance to make mm -hmm. sure it's the right fit for your current situation. Yeah. Again, something that should be done on a regular basis. Yeah. yeah. Just pick up the phone every now and then and ring everyone. Yeah, I don't know if you want to ring everyone. But <laughs> no. <laughs> but, yeah, so we, we have a lot. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, is there anything else that you would like to cover that we've kind of touched on when it comes to probably, yeah, people in mining specifically that, well, it wouldn't be particular to miners, but um, anyone who's on a really, really good wicket when it comes to you know, their pay packet and such is making sure that you, you only, you're working hard for your money, making sure you make it work for you. Um, so rather than you know racking up a whole lot of debt on credit cards and afterpay and civil pay and all these other kind of pays, um, let's look at, you know, I always tell my, everyone I talk to, weigh up your wants and needs. 
is it a want? Is it something you want before you go into debt for it? Or is it something you need? And a class need is something, well, if you don't have it, are you going to die? Well, now you sound like Julian. <laughs> so if you're not going to die, then rather squirrel some money away until you've got the cash lump sum to go and get what you want because cash is still king and you can negotiate a better price. Mm. So, And while you're squirreling that money away, you can be earning interest on it. So you know, you're making that money work for you rather than paying somebody else an exorbitant amount of interest. Or have it sitting in your offset account so you pay yep. less on the mortgage. Correct. Yeah. Mm, I got one right. Yeah, you got one right. <laughs> Something must be rubbing yeah. off. <laughs> I'm coming here more often. Yeah. But, but even in your offset accounts, I mean, what, what's the interest rate you're paying on your home loan at the moment? I actually know because I had a look yesterday. Okay. 4.91. 4.91. Okay. Um, so in an offset account... Your money that you're squirreling away and saving is effectively saving you 4.91% in interest. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were to buy it on a credit card and be paying it off at the minimum amount, you'd be paying upwards of 18% in interest. So, mm -hmm. smart way, you've got your money working for you. You might not be physically earning interest on it, but you're saving interest and you're still going to get what you want down the track. Yeah. Possibly at a discount. What was that bit? Possibly at a discount because you're going to have the cash to negotiate that. Oh, I like it so much. This is cool. <laughs> um, one more thing, and then we might start to wrap up, I think, is the afterpay and going for a loan. I also heard this because you have a big banking background as well. Yes. So I heard this, you share because I've never heard this before. Alrighty, so. Um, I have, in a previous life, worked <laughs> in a bank um, as a financial advisor in a bank. So I may have been that person that said to you, you need 700 bucks a week <laughs> on your insurances. Because <laughs> you nah. didn't get the commission. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Um, I've always been about striking that balance between affordability and what you actually need. Yeah. Um, but having worked really closely with the bankers in the banking environment, um, with your after pays and zip pays, a lot of people don't look at them as credit facilities, but they get treated the same when the banks are looking at it to assess your loaning ability. If you apply for a home loan or anything, you do have to declare that you've got these debts with your afterpay and zip pay, mm -hmm. um, which can impact how much you can loan or whether or not a loan even gets approved. As we heard at lunch, um, through one of the motor vehicle finance groups, if you've got an afterpay or zip it's a straight up decline, they won't even give you a car loan. Yes. So, yeah, mm -hmm. just something to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's easy money, but it's going to come at a cost somewhere mm -hmm. along the line, it's going to bite you in the dime. So, they don't look at store cards that bad because that's kind of like a line of credit, isn't it? Yep, so that would so get that's like a credit card. It would get treated mm -hmm. the same way as a credit card because generally with your store cards, there will be an interest component and a minimum repayment that you've got to make. So it is, like you say, yeah. almost like a line of credit yeah. with the store. Whereas afterpay is take it home now and just pay it off. Yeah. Like lay by in reverse. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. And online, you don't even have to go in the store and yeah. pay it away. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. That's too much. Oh, well, that wasn't too hard, was it? That wasn't too hard. It was actually quite good to, to be able to just talk freely about a lot of things. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the things that we've covered is only a small portion of what financial advisors do. Um, it is a whole myriad of different things that we can help with as well. Yeah. And I guess, do you do uh, personal finances, business finance as well? Or um, is that a different sort of advisor? Or? It all depends on when you say business advice, what, what we're talking about there. Um, if you're talking about, you know, like business plans and how to grow your business, probably more suited to an accountant type place yes. because yes. that's dealing with that. But where we're looking at if you've got a business in place and there's one person that's critical to making sure that that business runs, well, then we can look at how do we ensure if something happens to that particular person to make sure that the business can still continue into the future. Yeah. Or if you've got you know, agreements between different parties that are unrelated, 
So let's say you and I were to go into business because we're not related. Um, how do we cope with a situation if one of us were to fall off the perch? Mm. Um, you probably don't want to be in business with my husband. I might not want to be in business with your partner. Oh, the real minor. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or vice versa. So how do we make sure that if something were to happen to me for argument's sake, that you could buy out my share mm. of the business so that you're then in control of it? So, yeah. so again, it's about control of the – so, yeah, if you're in a business, uh, you need to know where you stand mm-hmm. within that, yeah. the financial realms of that, yeah. as well as your own personal banking, as well as your family, as well as the kids, as well as mum and dad and everyone. Yeah. Oh, there's so much to it, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It, it's, mm. yeah, it, it's a very wide field, mm. um, and, yeah, we can go across a whole lot of it, really. Yeah. Well, welcome to Hurt Mackay. You've been living here for a while. 13 years. Oh, you've been here for 13 years. You just said Australia. Yeah. I know you're new with, um, with Bantax. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a new role. So, yeah. yeah. Look forward to seeing you more often because I love these offices. I'm going to come in here and record my podcast. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Why not? And there's a nice little bar around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> we might say goodbye and pop down and have a drink. Thanks so much, Monica. It was awesome. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Hello again. Well, well, what a great conversation. I have so much homework to do now with my finances. How about you? Did you find some value in there? And do you have some things that you need to tweak? Perhaps talk about with your family or your partner or your accountant? or your financial advisor, or perhaps with Monica. This isn't a great big fat advert for Bantax Accounting Group. However, they're the people I know who I respect, and we've already heard Julia share her thoughts about what we should do with our money, and now we get to hear it again in a different way with the wonderful Monica. Thanks, Monica, for sharing your insight with us and I look forward to hearing much more. To find out more, check out the show notes at madmumsy.com forward slash beers61. And when you do connect for your first free initial consult, be sure to tell Monica that the mad, crazy woman called Mad Mumsy sent you. (laughs) Please share this podcast with your mates. Subscribe in your favourite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. And if anyone asks you, how do I get a job in the mines, send them my way. I've got a few little freebies for them. Keep me up on all the social medias, at Mad Mumsy, M-U-M-Z-I-E, on everything. And join the Beers with a Mine Up podcast Facebook closed group. Yes, so we've got a Facebook group that is growing. It's tripled in size in the last, ever since I interviewed Melissa, actually, in episode 60. So welcome all of the Melissa tribe from Prospect Recruitment. You will find in the group, I share pictures and little videos of me when I'm setting up ready for an interview. And, you know, you can chat to me in there. It's a closed group, so we won't fill up your Facebook feed with all your mates. It's just you. You'll get notifications. So please come in. Um... I get excited every time I see a new member request. And there's two questions. If you can answer them, that'd be great. But you don't have to, but, you know, it helps me out to know what sort of things that you're after. And now I've got to go because I'm going to watch the footy finals. Right now, as I'm recording this outro so that I can hopefully share this episode with you on the weekend, uh, Geelong are playing Collingwood. Collingwood are winning. This is AFL uh, football. Collingwood are winning 20 to 7. And if you know me, you know I hate Collingwood because I'm from South Australia and you know I was born like that. So uh, the Crows are out. We didn't make the finals. And my other team, yes, I have two teams. Keep listening. You would you'd know that by now. I've got two teams. I've got the Adelaide Crows and the Brisbane Lions. And the Brisbane Lions, oh my God, we're doing so well. And we're playing tomorrow night. We're playing Richmond at home in front of a sellout crowd at the Gabba. 
I'm just saddened that I'm not actually there like I used to be back in our heyday, 2001, 2, 3. Um, that's right. Time's changing. I'm going to have to update my tattoo. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's win our first final. So, right, I'm off. Cheers. Stop rambling, Mad Mumsy. And I hope to see you in the Facebook group. If not, hit me up anyway. Cheers. Oh, and until next time, stay safe, be real, be special, and have fun, for we only need once. Cheers, my friends.